I V M. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uncle Please Sit. My name is Tushar Ravi Chandani, and with me, as always, is my co-host and host, uh, Joel. Hi, Pare- it's hi. I am Joel Pereira. Wow, that was uh, the most disappointing <laughs> hi that I've ever seen. <laughs> What happened? And 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 the tradition continues. Yeah, we, you know, we really need to we really need to sit and create a script. You know, like a sort of like where we have where we have lines yeah, because that seems to be the only way we can do an in, this intro properly. Paramita, if you don't doing a correct intro, it's it's just not going to happen. I guess it's it's our tradition. I guess at this point. <laughs> so you know, uh, Joel, uh, how's things are good? Things are good. Things are good. things are have not changed which is good you know what i'm saying makes sense makes sense yeah so, nothing has changed since the last time we spoke which was the last podcast that we recorded <laughs> and i take that as a good thing i guess it makes sense in this time so yeah today i'm very excited because we have a very special guest uh, and uh, someone whose uh, cv is going to take a long time for us to sort of uh, read through because there's a lot of stuff there So uh, first of all let me introduce our guest today uh, Paramita Vora uh, Paramita hi Paramita how's it going Hi hi how are you guys all Hi Paramita how's it going Wait but before we go forward i need to sort of uh, do the whole uh, i need to introduce you properly to all our guests uh, so guys yeah uh, we don't often have such illustrious guests on our because, show uh, mostly mostly other times it's our uh, uh, contact list <laughs> <laughs> So yes so let me tell you this Paramita Vora is a documentary filmmaker who makes documentaries on urban life culture and gender uh Paramita is uh, the founder of Paro Devi Pictures they make pictures on again urban life culture and gender uh she's also the creative director of Agents of Ish uh, a website that you should definitely check out because i've checked it out a bunch of times it's a lot of fun uh it's basically a digital platform that uh, produces sort of multimedia content on uh, sex education sexual experience and sexual etiquette and uh, the best part about this website is that uh, this whole platform is that uh, it produces uh, content uh, the approach to content is very positive it's fairly playful uh because the idea is to make uh, the topic uh, sort of easy to access more accessible to people so you should definitely check out check it out there are lots of podcasts there are uh, lots of uh, videos there are uh, po- there's a lot of poetry and uh, you might also have seen uh, you may have also seen one of their vi- uh, a bunch of their viral videos uh, the amorous adventure of uh, shaku and mega in the valley of consent uh, it's basically a lovely song about uh, you know the yes no and maybe of the point of consent um and there are a bunch of other videos and uh, i think that is the introduction <laughs> <laughs> i think parameter have we covered everything have we have no, we been fair you haven't covered everything but who wants to be completely covered anyway yeah <laughs> <laughs> well said well said so how's it going parameter not bad well actually i feel like in the lockdown i'm working even harder than i did before Uh, but so how how are you doing this with like sh- no shoots happening and no like other stuff happening so like so, what so i guess you know th- that is a limitation that uh, we can't shoot videos at least of the kind that we like to shoot uh but uh, for us we are not dependent on we're not a commercial site so we don't have this thing like every week we got to produce a video otherwise we'll faint out of irrelevance hmm. so hmm. i think uh, what agents of ishk is really is kind of a, it's a hugely co-created space hmm. and the audience that is in agents of ish contributes their narratives to the site so it's not only that we produce content but it is that the followers what 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 people call user generated content but it's really like user contributed narratives so actually post lockdown we've been getting even more than ever before because people have a lot of time to think a lot of time to reflect on their own intimate lives mm-hmm. and they also have the time and the desire to express that so we've been getting a lot of poetry some a lot of erotic poetry and we've been getting a lot of personal essays as well so there's that and you know we uh, do have a lot of graphic content not graphic in that sense but graphical <laughs> content also graphic yeah, yeah. Uh, but so we because we're a multimedia site we don't actually feel limited uh, by having to produce any one thing and i think social media is exciting because it allows you to have so many types of conversations with people so mm-hmm. recently we we also do we asked people on instagram if you had to sing a song to your naked body what would it be 
And so it becomes a way of building community. And it's not just about us generating content and audience passively consuming it. It's yeah. together in a way. Nice. Like a positive silver. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my favorite part. I've been following Agents of Ishq for years now on Twitter because Twitter is my primary social media uh, platform. And what I love the most about the site outside of the outside of the articles and the poetry and everything is the are the illustrations, mm. the artwork and the create the graphic creatives. I really, really like that's their entire style that you guys have adopted. Thank you. This kind of comic, not comic exactly, but you know what I'm saying? It's humorous. I don't know how. It's yeah. Humorous. It's tongue in cheek and it's playful. Yeah, yeah exactly. That is something I really, really like about this website. Thank you. Thank you. I remember there was also that, I think, uh, uh, orgasm related shairi that there was some, some series. Masturbation. That, Masturbation, yeah. shairi. Masturbation. Masturbation shairi. Masturbation shairi. Shairi, yeah. I remember like following a lot because a lot of people are putting up lots of fun stuff. Yeah. Actually, it's a tradition at Agents of Ishq. Every year in the month of May, we do the Masturbation Shairi Contest. Uh-huh. And the prize is a coupon to be used on a sex toy website. And the first year that we did it around four years ago, we, we didn't think anybody would actually send stuff. We were like, let's try it. Uh-huh. We actually got a large number of poems and pretty good ones. And uh, in every year, in the beginning, we had only opened it to women. Because yeah. we felt that women don't get to talk about these things that much. But then the contest became so popular that we've opened it up to everybody. Mm. And mm. I think one of the most interesting things about the contest is that we get in entries in English, Hindi, Bangla, Kannada, Tamil, Malayalam, like Gujarati. So the number of languages in which people submit is also interesting. And mm. uh, the kinds of poems, like I think, you know, to echo what Joel is saying, what is so nice is you discover that people really have a sense of maza. Yeah. And that yeah. they, they are quite, actually, if you create a comfortable space, then people comfortably express themselves. And there's mm. a lot of joy in that because the poems can be funny, they can be sexy, they can be serious, they can be very emo also sometimes. It's all good and uh, it actually just enriches a side and creates something for everybody to relate to. I think yeah, that's I think that's the essence of whatever we've seen from Agents of HK is just the maza of it. I think yeah. is I think is at the core of it, which which I really like. Our it. tagline is we give sex a good name. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I think that when you were saying that the drawings are nice or the illustrations are nice, that is something we thought about a lot because you know the internet has so when I when the internet first came, I was a younger person, and one of the mm. things I loved about the internet was it was all the it was a place where people went who didn't really fit into the world much. Like mm-hmm. we were not in mm-hmm. the mainstream space. And so to mirror that, the internet was full of kind of quirky, awesome, strangely creative spaces. Yeah. Now the internet is corporate owned to a great extent. So while it still provides space for a lot of variety, or I would say for a lot of diversity, but not maybe that much variety. So you often get that yeah. feeling that everything's feeling the same. And we didn't want that to happen because I think if you're talking about pleasure, it should be pleasurable. It should not hmm. feel like we are school or we are homework kar rahe type of uh-huh. feeling. No. Hmm. So hmm. the idea and because the websites all for the mobile phone, all of that technology doesn't really allow you to be very creative in the structure unless you spend like shitloads of money. Hmm. So Correct. actually the idea of having a lot of handmade illustrations and working with a very wide pool of artists. We don't work only, we do a lot of stuff in-house, but we also work with a large group of freelancers. And we keep adding to that group. So it created a kind of warmth and it created that tactile fun. It gave mm. people something extra when you came in. So it was like eating a really good plate of safe puri, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> that's how it should feel, I think. Yeah, it's perfect. So actually, this is a great segue into what we're going to be discussing today. Mm-hmm. Joel, share the topic of the day. <laughs> today, we are going to be talking about uh, sex and sex education and uh, talking about the squeamishness that it attracts, uh, talking about um, the fact that there is, and there is, despite, you know, the work that Paramita and a lot of other people are doing, there is a lot of, um, there is a need for more uh, sex education, more conversations, basically, about sex education, the sexual experience, sexual etiquette, consent, these kind of things. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty interesting, but first we will take a very short break and come back and talk more about this. Hey everybody, welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. 
We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money. So, a great week of shows behind us, and hope that you've been catching up on as much of it as you can. We had Abhishek Bachchan on Football Shoot Ball. Yeah, let me say that again. Abhishek Bachchan was on Football Shoot Ball. Did I mention Abhishek Bachchan was on Football Shoot Ball? That was a fun episode. You should definitely check that out. Really, really deep conversation about cricket and things like that. We had Vikram Kochar on Cyrus Says talking about the platforms and stuff like what's going on over there. On uh, the note, Maruk had spoken to Sanjay Jha, which was again a really, really interesting conversation. On Edges and Sledges, the guys are having an interesting conversation about, well, you know, what are favorite formats of cricket and things like that. So it's just really been a really, really awesome week on the network, and please do check things out. And with that, let's get you back to your show. And we're back to an all new episode of Uncle Please Sit. Uh, with us today is our very special guest. Her name is Paromita Vora. She's a documentary filmmaker and also creative director of Agents of Ishq. Uh, Paromita, welcome back. Thank you. And today we're going to be talking about, like we said, sex education. And uh, what, Paromita, where would we start in a conversation like this? Like, you know, for a, for a lot of time, uh, people would consider sex education to be taboo. Uh, do you think, you know, we we were all in school at one point, Tushar and me definitely were. And uh, we've been... I, <laughs> <laughs> I have vague memories. Like I was in a boy, I was in a Catholic school and mm-hmm. I was in a place called Vasai, which is a distant, distant suburb of Bombay. And uh, it was Catholic school. And we had two perfunctory sex education classes that were run by. Uh, so the school was run by Christian brothers. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this was uh, so basically it was my football coach who <laughs> had a conversation with us mm-hmm. about boys, y'all are changing now. And this is what's going to happen. <laughs> and and that was that. Though I uh, I came the from a, uh, the tagline. Sorry, was, don't do it. No, the tagline. No, it, we didn't even go that far. Uh-huh. Oh, it didn't even go that far. It was like, boys, this is what's going to happen, and y'all are changing now, and y'all are young men, and it comes with lots of responsibilities. And uh, pray, please pray a lot. <laughs> that was. <laughs> That was that was our uh, introduction to sex education when we, we were in school. Uh, so I I was in a school in uh, Jamnagar, which is in the middle of nowhere in Gujarat, in the corner of Gujarat. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have sex education. We just had two CBSC uh, lessons on reproduction, which were very dry lessons on what a period is, what basically the parts are, and then we moved on. Mm. We were all very excited because, you know, that's the thing, like in 8th or ninth standard, you're like, this will get interesting. Mm. But uh, obviously, it was a dry, dead thing, which just uh, did nothing for us. Yeah. Like, which explained nothing, which barely taught us anything. And of course, uh, being the idiot, 13-year-old boys that you are, you were hoping for some sort of, uh, I don't know, titillation or what, whatever would be the appropriate word here. But of course, none of that was there. Um and we learned nothing. But I mean, you know, now that I, sorry, now that I think about it, when I was in class nine, I think we had a, we had something called the mumps inspection. I don't know if you, if it still happens mm-hmm. in school, but here's how it went. So basically we were all lined up in the auditorium. The auditorium had a stage and had an ante room, like a green room. And in there was a nurse And her job was basically to get us to drop trousers and bend over a desk and grab us, grab us from behind and basically uh, examine our testicles basically for mumps. And that was, and she actually gave us a fair bit of information about stuff because she was asking us questions like, uh, do you have any questions about like, you know, your body and whatever, whatever during the examination process. Hmm. Okay. So I don't know. I don't recall where this, where this came from, but if I, if I remember right, it was government mandated at that time. And I think that was, that was the most sex education we had in our school. It's unique. I've never heard this. I must say in all these years of being in school. <laughs> Well, but when, if you didn't have, well, I mean, you, I think you had more sex education than I had in school. That's for sure. Mm. Because mm. all I faintly remember is we had male reproductive system and female reproductive system as lessons in biology. Yeah. And then we used to have, I was in Delhi in CBSE school and we used to have something called health education. 
which may be yeah. overlapped with some of this, but I have no memory of it. I do remember that I was quite a goody goody kid, you know, like I didn't get into trouble. But somehow hmm. or the other in that one class that I m- might have been talking or anyway, I got punished. And my punishment was, or maybe somebody else, maybe a boy got punished. But the punishment was that you had to sit next to the opposite sex while that lesson oh. was on. So that you would be so okay. and embarrassed that you would just keep quiet. Which kind of did happen. But all I can say is that I don't have any memory of any of that stuff. It seems so disconnected hmm. from anything that we were thinking or feeling. But my question hmm. Guys, so where did you learn about sex? Um, honestly, it was the internet. Uh, and like, I don't know, sometimes picking up a lot of wrong information from TV and movies and internet. Because I remember, uh, especially like, because I think the last six years of school were in this place called Jamnagar, as I mentioned. And this was literally in the middle of nowhere. And we also didn't have uh, seniors. We were the second batch of that school. It was a new school. So... Um, we had just all sorts of horrible information. I remember just uh, people didn't know. Like uh, they, some people thought that if you sleep naked with a woman, she becomes pregnant. Some people thought that if you, uh, uh, I, I distinctly remember this one thing where one of our seniors had come back from college and she was walking towards us. And one of my friends is like, you know, she's had sex. I'm like, wait, how? <laughs> She's walking differently. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. women, women's hips open up if they have sex. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? So, okay. yeah, so we had, I think all of it was, and I think the, the more accurate stuff eventually came via the internet and just, I guess, just talking to some smarter people. Mm. Mm. No, for me, it was, uh, I was, a, I'm little older than Tushar, like a, a three years older or so. Mm. So, for me, it was uh, porn. Basically, that was the introduction. And I, I was an athlete as well. I played football. So we traveled and you hung out with boys who were older than you and they filled your heads with all sorts of nonsense, which took years to get rid of, mm. you know, like literally like years to get to like, uh, I guess that it conditions you right at that time when you're 15 and 16 and 17 years old. Yeah. And it took years to get rid of these these weird ideas, you know, that have put into your head. Even though I came from a relatively liberal family yeah. where we spoke about, because my mother is a mental health professional herself. So we spoke about these things, you know, and even then it took me a while and I cannot imagine how it must be for other people. Yeah. But I mean, I think, I, I mean, speaking for myself, I'm older mm-hmm. than well, maybe older than both of you put together. I don't know. But when I was young, there was no internet. So that's how old I am. Like I'm from the time before the internet. And, uh, you know, we didn't really have a means of finding information except if you found a book somewhere. And even pornography. I mean, it's not like the kind of easy access to pornography that people have today wasn't really yeah. present. Because, you know, you always had some uncle or somebody with some porno and then you would ferret it out. But... As you're, as you're saying, a lot of it is, you know, in a shadowy kind of space and it's mixed up with some myth making and some rumors and somebody who sounds cooler than you telling you how things actually are. But in fact, it's also that I don't know in my time when I was young as a teenager, I don't remember a lot of women talking about it to each other either. I think in an earlier time, there was this thing that people couldn't necessarily access porn easily. And of course, they spoke to each other about these things. There was much curiosity. And more than curiosity, I mean, you're in your teens. Everybody's full of desire. Everybody's full of hormones. So it's actually something you wish to know about from the inside out. It's not It's not just like, oh, there is a secret thing and we would like to know about it. It's, it's actually a personal need that you're expressing when you're curious about these things. And mm. uh, But at the same time, I think that women, when I was a teen, didn't talk so openly about sex. They alluded to it. They spoke a little bit about it, just enough to seem cool, but not so much that you will be called fast or be slut shamed. Mm. And mm. that's, of course, I think a tightrope walk that women still do, but less than they did once upon a time. You know? I mean, things are far different than that today. Uh, and certainly the internet has made access to information and even to pornography, democratizing. Mm. So it's not that yeah. they reside with somebody who has it. And you have to believe them. But that said, until today, even when there is so much information out there, what we found while researching Agents of Ish before we started it was that 
pornography and older friends or or friends was a major source of information on sex until today for young people um and even in schools i mean there was an effort to introduce sex edu- introduce sex education as part of the syllabus at one point but it was banned by the government in several states it is there in some states but not there in most states so there is a kind of shadow space that sex education sexual conversation etc continues to live in uh and i think what what you also said joel that we need more conversations actually it's not enough just to have information hmm. thing is that there isn't it's not a limited amount of information that you need one time you know it's an unlimited area of experience and there's a lot of lot of lot of diversity in it every human being is different so really unless there are many many conversations unless conversation is plentiful and uh, we are always getting a space to think about ourselves these are those experiences if we are seeing it in movies not only porn films but if mm. we see movies if we are reading poetry about it if we are reading erotica uh, if there are conversations on television about sexual life then it slowly becomes more normal so to say and mm. we form our own relationship to it in an informed and also in a in a, in a meaningful way right something that will be meaningful for our own lives not just something that was it's like you know we learn physics in school but we don't always apply it to our everyday life like we know some concepts but we are not living yeah. by those so sex education needs to be a continuing it's a lifelong learning actually it's mm. not limited mm. to school but if we don't start it how are we going yeah. to continue it that becomes a question and yeah, so i i guess Oh, sorry. sorry i guess that uh, a lot of at least a lot of people have this thought or belief that sex education is something that you just pick up along the way it's like mm-hmm. a life skill that you just learn which cannot be further from the truth considering that like anything else it also needs to be taught to you right it's like you don't like just as you don't learn how to drive a car or ride a bicycle or swim which are also life skills you cannot like see, these are this, this is something that you can't just pick up right i think because it's also uh, partially thought of as a frivolous thing no like a lot of times you'll be you'll hear from people you know what is the need for sex education children should focus on studies and other important things in life not you know these frivolous things so hmm. even our attitude towards it is fairly like ke itna important nahi hai well i think that the attitude to sex is determined by a lot of different things and i would disagree that it's like learning to swim or riding a bicycle uh so, since i don't yeah. know how to ride a bicycle i can assure you it's very different i'm getting by fine without knowing how to ride a bicycle though so far but <laughs> but the thing is that i think it, it sex falls into an interesting in between space where yes some of it is instinctual of course you mm. know uh if left to ourselves to be our natural selves we will all discover who we are sexually it's not as if people didn't know how to have sex or had no sexual imagination or sexual etiquette before we had something called sex education right but it's just mm. just that most of the time we are not left to be our natural selves we are surrounded by a number of instructions and messages and conditioning about what it means to be a person just a person mm. what mm. is a guy what what is the correct kind of gendered behavior there are so many coded messages about caste about class about sexuality so mm. what is correct the norm nobody needs to say it but it's the assumption that sex happens between a man and a woman a male and a female and it should happen inside ma- marriage mm. for the purpose of producing children mm. this is mm. actually thought that underlies yeah most of the discussion about sex is ki koi zarurat nahi hai for you to learn yeah. about sex because please focus on your studies or yes of romance wagera so tumhara dimag kharab ho jayega you know like the worst thing that could be said to you when you were in school was Oh my god an intelligent girl like you you know becoming boy mad it's very sad as if to say mm. being intelligent and being boy mad are mutually exclusive but 100% i can tell you they're not because i think i'm pretty intelligent and i've certainly had my boy mad phases you know so i think that this this the separation of yeah. sex and making it always mm. an image, it's outside of normal life yet it is mm. part of a normal life because we are all expected to get married right yeah it is such a fixation So if you say that I don't want to get married what does that mean that you create this panic that actually you are questioning the, this kind of uh closeted sexual like all of sex is closeted actually hmm. so when you say you don't want to get married you're really saying as an adult I could be sexual outside of marriage hmm. outside of heterosexual hmm. marriage you know I could be queer uh, I could be a single person who has sex 
So the world of non-matrimonial sex is discouraged and we are not supposed to know about it as a part of our life. When okay. we are talking about the body, as children even, what is this peta, it's your nose, what is this, like, you know, all that little dimple chin, all those poems we learn. But you come to yeah. the parts of the body and you have to skip right ahead. It's as if they're not there. We won't name them. We won't admit that they are there. So there's a lot of mm. this kind of taboo, hesitation, conditioning. And the other notion that when you get married, automatically... Yeah, I think that was, I think that was, that was the point I was so inarticulately trying to make. <laughs> Ki automatically a jayega. Like that's what I was. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that Shadi is also proposed as a solution to so many things. Oh and God, yeah. Maybe considering that it has been failing regularly, maybe it is time to phase it out because, you know, if somebody has mental illness, people would say, but Shadi ho jayega, to theek ho jayega. Oh, yeah. So, any what, time uh, you settle down. Right? Settle down, settle down. No, and what what I what I what amuses me the most about this is we spend till your 22, 23, 25, whatever, till whenever you get married or 30, whatever. Uh, or never. Huh? Or never, or never. I, I don't think anyone on this call is married. Are you married? I'm not. Okay, so none of us are. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, uh, till whatever time you get married or don't get married, you're you put into this thing where like do not talk to the opposite sex. Stay away from them. Do not be around them. Don't have a sexual thought. And then suddenly you're like, okay, now I have marriage, have kids, have sex, whatever the fuck you yeah, want. Yeah. Like it is, it's like we just don't get, like, you know, in everything else, we have this process, ki, achha, ye seekho, uske baad aage jao, phir ye kar hmm. in this case, we're like, no, no, pretend it doesn't exist, doesn't exist, doesn't exist, doesn't exist. Okay, now do it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, another thing that is, I mean, whatever limited amount of sex that happens now in schools or what is called sex ed, which I don't know if I want to call it sex ed. Yeah. Um, it is that uh, you learn about menstruation. Huh. Mm. Maybe a little, little bit about puberty, yeah. but that's kind of it. So in many ways, this also links sexuality to reproduction. Yeah. Whatever you are learning mm. about sex, it's not about being an individual human being who will exchange pleasures with another human being or human beings for life. It mm. is just about being a reproductive ca- character. <clears throat> Hmm. So, so I think they think that, you know, sex education is like the kind of thing that will pollute the minds of yeah. kids and force them to have more sex, apparently. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. although what they have found in like, so in countries where they have introduced sex education at, at an early age, hmm. what they have found, in fact, is that it often delays the first time of having sex or what we call the sex yes. education, right? yeah. so it delays the age yeah. of sex education and it also decreases the number of uh, teen pregnancies. So yeah. in other words, in fact, if you equip people with information and conversation and just the entire thought and culture around sexual life, you mm-hmm. enable them to take better care of themselves. You enable them to know uh, what they want and to act on that. Whereas when mm-hmm. you don't talk about it, what you really find when there's a lot of morality around sex and also a lot of secrecy and silences around sex, mm-hmm. What mm. you actually find is a larger number of people putting themselves at risk. Mm. Mm. And therefore, because you're so, I mean, there is nothing to be done about the fact that once you start hitting puberty, you are full of sexual desire as a human being. And yeah. you are also very, very curious to experience life in general, right? As you're mm. growing up. So this will be part of your experimentation. Of course, it's going to be. And it will always have, it will often happen in a desperate way because you've got to have it because it's mm. something bidden to you right so you are not thinking about it in terms of what you want you are thinking about it in terms of getting something which you're not allowed to have so you're not always thinking about your own safety you're not thinking about safe sex you're not Mm. thinking about consent you're not thinking about what would i like you know so uh, quite different from that is how we are educated to think about fashion or food nobody's telling you fashion is frivolous they are encouraging you to understand taste and become an influencer on Instagram by modeling some corporate produced clothes, which, yeah. So, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but essentially we are often encouraged to find our own way when it comes to deciding about clothes or food. And we admire people who have good taste in all this, who know a lot about it, mm. but we don't think about sex, which is also born of the appetites of human beings, just mm. as much as mm. 
that's something. I mean, even when it comes to talking about food, we all remember those lessons where we were told what a balanced meal is, yeah. what are vitamins, and so you, you learn about food in various ways. You first learn about its nutritional value. You learn about what is poisonous, being careful of things that are toxic and not toxic, and then you start learning about taste. And if you want to become a chef, then maybe you learn about gourmet food, etc. Right. So I feel that same progression doesn't happen with sex education, and. in fact knowledge about your body which you should know as an individual gets mixed up with reproduction and so it also creates more mess in our heads which actually i mean it's great to hear that you guys unlearn some of it but many people don't unlearn it unlearn it till they die in day actually they just continue mm. i'll 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 give you an example of this where uh, you know how especially in the movies that you saw in the 90s and 80s and stuff like that where um, it was always the guy wooing the girl But always, like he had to deceive her. Like he had to be like, "Thoda smart bano, thoda ye bano, thoda wo bano." And the ladki doesn't want it. She will mm. want it if you fasao her. Basically, that was the logic. Yeah. And you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, and and I was just like, you know, when we started, like you know, when all of us started dating, there was always this impression in our heads that we were doing something devious in the sense that the girl doesn't want it, but yeah. I am taking her on a date so that she. Sort of, you know, gets into that whole mode in the sense it's like so she, I can soften her up basically. Yeah, so I can soften it. It's and it's like it took me a long time to go like, oh wait, I like her, she likes me, and it, this is a normal thing. It doesn't I have think, to be. I think the really like the difficult part. There are so many difficult levels of this, right? Like this story that you tell that we think that all intimate interaction is about deception. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. all about pusslowing each other. Yeah, you know, like you have to coerce and convince and somehow pusslow a girl into having sex because she can never ever want it. Yeah, and mm. boys, of course, have nothing else on their minds. Like one of the biggest, biggest things you'll find across India, and maybe English-speaking people have learned to disguise it with a whole lot of woke language. But you scratch the surface, and you'll find those things there too. People saying, "Oh, girls, they only care about boys with money. Mm. Boys, they only care about one thing." You know. Now the thing is. that is a training that is given to us that's why i'm saying that sex cannot be thought of independently without also thinking about gender without also thinking about class caste and mental health mm. culture that is outside us what we think is entertaining what we think is enjoyable like even things that we find enjoyable you know all of these things that's why sex is a very interesting kind of area of study because it's all of life and yet it is something spe- it is something different and yet it is intertwined with all of these things so it's very difficult to make one absolute statement about what one should do but the idea that you have to somehow coerce convince and push love a woman into having sex with you it's at the root of so much violence you know on the one hand yeah. the impossibility of understanding consent when again and again we say why aren't boys getting consent and when we come up with slogans like yes means yes and no means no we all know in our hearts that's very insufficient Yeah. Mm. We all know that it's not that simple, and actually, sexual interaction is very complex. Mm. So, how do we create an ability in ourselves to hear what is not exactly said, but is conveyed, and mm. respect the unspoken between our, between each other? Right. For that, you do need an education in sexual life, and the first position of education, other than the body and understanding all of the things to do with the body, but when it comes to people, psychology, behavior, the first thing you have to acknowledge is every being. has different desires everybody is a desiring being of some kind but desire does not mean the same thing for everybody mm. if that's your first mm. position and you think that of course women have desires you will try to understand their desires right but in fact we live in a world where we are told only men have sexual desires and all the depiction of desire is supposed to be something even that i'm i would question i mean i would really like to understand from at least straight men whether the desires that they see depicted on screen are really the desires they have you know sometimes pornography allows for a variety of desires to be depicted because it's something people deeply want but our notion of masculine sexuality is also based on a stereotype that oh, all men want to have sex all the time as much as they can there are many men like that and there are many men who don't want to right so actually it doesn't accommodate the full range so even women are taught to think oh you can always get you can always make a man have sex with you If, if you make a man have sex with you then you can get him to do whatever you want to do this is a horribly mm. unkind way to think about each other so it doesn't really lead either to a good sex life or to actually good relationships between people right mm. if we are always playing this game with each other 
So the actual actually one of the reasons agents of ishq is called ishq hmm. is because ishq is a word that combines sex, love, desire, passion. It's not one or the other. It's hmm. all of these things together, and we have to learn about all hmm. of these together because. It's the basis of relationships, all relationality. No, and I think it's also because uh, we we split sex and love into very separate yeah. things all the time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that this binary of love and sex, you know, the other interesting thing that we found when we were researching agents of Ishq, and which I also, I mean, I do think that one of the ways in which we learn about these things is also by doing them, right? I mean, a lot of what we learn about love and sex is by having a love and sex life. If you're not allowed to have one, if you're told that I'm mm. going to who you marry and you'll have to marry at 22 and that's going to be the sum total of your experience you're also preventing a learning in that in that a part of life now i'm not saying that arranged marriages are bad and love marriages are good i don't believe in those dichotomies i'm just saying that a time to explore your own intimate life is not given to people very often but if you do have that if you do decide as i did at a pretty young age that you are going to be a single person and you're going to live alone and you're going to have a certain kind of intimate life you make a lot of mistakes let me say like i made a lot of mistakes but i'm not going to say that i regret my mistakes because i learned from every mistake that i made right so the capacity mm. to free your mind the biggest journey really is that you have to free your mind from the meanings that other people have taught you that life sex and identity have so the idea that a woman who wishes to have sex is somehow not womanly mm. or she's Oh, that's really off-putting. You know, that's something that you have to unlearn even for yourself, hmm. and to be able to articulate what you feel. If you feel you have been badly treated, there wasn't a lot of space. Like when I was young, a lot of people would tell you, "Well, if you are going to like, you know, have sex with guys without being in a proper relationship with them, then of course they're going to treat you badly." Hmm. There is no of course about it. Nobody has to treat anybody badly, no matter what, right? So having the confidence to say, "No, I don't care." who made what category this is what i believe and i want this hmm. when you start doing that you start making more space for it you start hopefully finding some other people but i think that learning is you know very far away from us we have some surface ideas about this hmm. now what we found when we were doing research for agents of ish was that earlier there was shame in talking about sex right then if you've had sex you didn't tell each other like a lot of people in my class in college People hmm. didn't tell each other. I didn't tell anybody either the first time because you just were like, I don't know what people will think if I tell them. Now we find that a lot of people feel ashamed if they don't have sex, or if they they all think that you have to be cool and sexually very active and having you know and having no emotion about it. So there is actually no difference because you're still keeping a dichotomy between love and sex. Hmm. You're just flipping it and saying, oh, love, it's all rubbish. There's no such thing. I'm so cash. I just hook up and move on. I'm all no strings attached, but underneath it, you're still not talking about what you really want because it's just something that's given to you, and that's what mm-hmm. you're supposed to say to be cool. But that's not necessarily what it means to be you. There is a very big mm-hmm. difference. Right? So the learning about sex and sex education is really an education in becoming a person, mm-hmm. becoming confident about who you are, and saying even if it is not what the world tells me, I should like. or i should be if i am not harming somebody if i am not violating somebody's consent or their safety in some way i am okay to be this way maybe the world tells me i should like thin girls but i can't mm. help i see a plump woman i feel attracted and i love it i love this person who is, who looks nothing like a movie star and i don't want to be ashamed of that feeling you mm. know it's all about those things and it's intertwined with saying like a lot of women are not saying they want they want men to use condoms men are always not trying to not use condoms we hear so many stories about that so many women feel unable to do it because since we don't talk about sex even when people have sex they are not talking about sex right because they don't have a language to talk about sex mm-hmm. so i feel mm-hmm. it's so it's so intertwined with being a happy person with being a self accepting person and when you're a self accepting person to some extent being accepting of others and at some level this idea about sex because it's our most private self and it includes both large identities identity of gender class and caste but also something that is other than that something that is completely you individual as a person that can't necessarily be categorized because it combines both of these things it's a very important bedrock for having a better society if we have mm. sex and it's a very expansive 
and full of heart sex education or loving sex education then i think it is a it's a journey to opening out a very radical reimagining of the world because if we say we are reimagining the way we relate to each other and relate to ourselves what we are really saying is a very deeply political thing we are saying yeah. we are reimagining all relationality in the world right so mm. i don't i think that the reason people say are ye to kuch ki tum kya ye sab kar rahe ho ye bekar cheeze hain is actually because it's so important because you know once you start thinking all of this it's very difficult to go back once you walk down yeah. that road you're opening so many doors mm. and you're letting so many things out and you're saying hey that taboo doesn't really apply hey i mean you're married and you're looking unhappy to me and i'm not married and i'm looking pretty happy on most days and unhappy on some days so maybe what everybody said to me won't be true right mm. if mm. they're doing research and finding that married people have deep loneliness if they don't have a circle of friends as well mm. so you're not going to automatically solve everything yeah. so once you start questioning the questions are endless so i think that's also why people want to keep it it is so essential to humanness that people like to control it because when they control it they can control other people and they can control all of society and have power over each other so i think uh, paramita that uh, when we were also reading when i was reading about this topic one of the major pushback i see from a lot of uh, say parents right about uh, is what is appropriate and what is not um is this the right age what is the right age what are your thoughts on that like you know on the one hand i've you know said they like a lot of people say you have to have these conversations with children and at the other time you have so much pushback from the people from their own guardians how do you deal with that well i think first position should be to deal with it with empathy mm. first you must remember that parents didn't have sex education mm. so they mm. also don't they're not equipped to the language to talk about it second thing which i love to say to young people who complain about their parents is shall we discuss your parents sex life and everybody like no 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 i don't <laughs> so the thing is <laughs> difficulty in accepting on both sides right so that i think it's yeah. like, i mean i just do that for fun uh to remind people that you may think you're very cool but you're not all that cool so let's be a little bit more sympathetic to the situation mm. and mm. i would say that you know things like agents of age for enfold india there are so many aram there are other organizations working on this one of the things that people are trying to do is to equip parents with that information and language it is about reaching young people but it's also mm. about interacting with grown ups because grown ups also need sex education we all need it you know mm. and we've had it so we are all trying to get it in some way or the other and uh, there there are the sex educators have developed a language to help parents with this so if parents mm. are thinking about it i would say congratulations as opposed to parents who just don't want to go there right mm. so if they're thinking about it there is this concept called age appropriate education that you don't like certain because it's so terrorizing if you say to me that i should have told my 5 year old niece about everything that happens during sex even i will get terrorized you know and i also had some very like non politically correct thoughts when as my niece who i am very close to is growing older i'm like i'm going to shut down agents of ish because i don't know if i can live up to my own <laughs> politics right now <laughs> you do feel all of those feelings you 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 feel scared that you won't be able to protect the child you love as they grow up from rejection from unfairness from unkindness so many other things so mm. uh, i think another thing that many sex educators will tell parents is that it is not helpful one of a big orthodoxy that has taken root is parents are okay with kids learning about sex and sex education only if you tell them it will help to protect them from sexual abuse mm. so this is a very prohibitive approach and it has resulted in a very fashionable concept of good touch and bad touch which mm. unfortunately is popularized on national television and so everybody thinks it's a good thing and you mm. see the fact that good touch and bad touch used everywhere but many sex educators will tell you this is not a helpful thing to, to teach a child so one thing is age appropriate education can be thought about in the same way as all other education don't think of sex ed as two classes in a year mm. don't think of sex ed you do one time download you know mm-hmm. it has to be a thread that runs through the whole of formal education it could start with just knowing parts of your body as the child grows older you can teach them concepts like privacy um and there are some really good videos uh, which we've made on agents of ish with sex educators and doctors which tell exactly how you can play these games to name your uh, name parts of your body but don't give euphemisms for sexual parts of the body 
mm-hmm. all the sexual part of the body is by its name so that people become relaxed about it um as kids grow older they would be told about attraction mm-hmm. they would be told about menstruation so as a child's body and mind develop you tell them bit by bit you break sex education down over a long period of time that said mm-hmm. um there is a really good essay by a sex educator which we published on agents of ish which proposes not talking about good touch and bad touch because it further stigmatizes sex and you know a young child is not always in a position to prevent just because mm. you taught a kid about good touch and bad touch doesn't mean the kid is in a position to prevent something happening to them mm. so supposing the bad touch happened to them so to speak if they were subjected to abuse that increases their guilt because they feel like oh my god i knew about the bad touch but i still let it happen to me that's one thing the mm. other thing is that because sexual touch can be pleasurable even if it is unwanted like it can create physical pleasure even if you're feeling fearful even if you're feeling it's wrong and i'm uncomfortable with this uncle doing this or this auntie doing this or whatever but there is also some physical pleasure experience it's confusing for the child right but so when you tell them it's good touch and bad touch that makes them feel very guilty and it's make likely to make them uh not so easy about telling you when something has happened mm. uh and finally when you divide things sexual into good and bad when you use these words good and bad you are creating these stigmatizations of what is allowed and not allowed right so for example is masturbation a bad touch are you telling mm. kids that oh masturbation chi 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 mat karo but it gives you pleasure so does mm. pleasure itself become a bad thing then so the associations that you start making in your mind with all pleasure being bad the idea that you push back against this way while still equipping a child so one of the things that sex educators now say is think in terms of consent of the child per se that is mm. why you can't teach sexual consent as a separate topic if in the whole of the rest of life there is no consent mm. so forcing a child to hug somebody not letting a child exercise what they wish to do Mm. all of this prevents the child from having a sense of consent so if you can early on talk about safe unsafe and confusing touch i'm not feeling safe i am not mm. feeling confused that's okay if you can know this and you don't want to go there you don't go there this enables a child to make decisions and it's something you'll have to enact in all your interactions with the child you can't do it only in one area of life so that is something parents have to learn it is about the very way in which you bring up a child that you have to incorporate these things right so, so the one thread that i'm getting through all of this is that like we need to stop looking at sex education as just sex education it, it's overall behavioral education of sorts it is it it's is holistic behavioral education yes it it it's, it's an education in what kind of person you're going to be and how you're going to be with other people right mm. at a very very basic level it's knowledge about your body it's knowledge about power dynamics it's knowledge about Uh, good behavior with others mm. it's knowledge about your safety your own desires you know there is a phrase that is used pleasure positive education people mm. talk about that there are different ways people describe conversations about sex so one phrase you might hear sometimes is sex positive mm. another phrase you would hear is pleasure positive what is the difference between these two the difference is that the way that the word sex positive has emerged is because very often when we talk about sex we talk about it in negative contexts mm. So if you think about what is the most common way we hear sex discussed publicly in India it would be in the context of violence mm. you're always yeah. reading about sexual violence you're always reading about violation of consent not about enacting mm. of right so the association in your mind becomes a negative one if it's sex it's in a negative place because there's no positive mm. or pornography has very bad effects on people's minds you not be told that oh there's some 10 awesome porn sites nobody's going to tell you right mm. so this is it, like Uh-huh. sorry this is like when we were younger also right we are uh, kids from the 90s right so for us we were drilled about remember this was uh, mid 90s to late 90s and hiv was yes. something that was introduced to us and we were i remember being for the for a long time being terrified of sex yes. you know because oh. it's like it's a death sentence and you will get it and you will die and like you know and we if despite all the despite the advertising and you know some of the information that came to us we were like oh if i like i remember when we were uh, i was in college at that time and we had a conversation about oh. urinals okay wherein 
if a someone who is hiv positive uses a urinal and this conve- i remember this because it was so bizarre wherein the guy, one guy was arguing that if they splash back onto you you are going to get hiv as well yeah and we were not equipped at that time to debunk this you know even though it sounded wrong but none of us knew that this was actually like incorrect you know at that time i remember being terrified Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Because there is terror. The word you're using, terrified. Like we were all just yeah. yeah. so were we when we were young. Because HIV actually hmm. started to get into public discussion in the mid to late eighties, and by yes. the mid eighties, it was in full flow, right? So we were all yeah. terrified. But the fact is, you know, you were also told that HIV happens only through sexual transmission, whereas of course you understand later that that's not the only way that fluids get exchanged. But when you're not talking about it in a sensible way, it's a bit like the present moment. We're talking about COVID mm. in the same fashion, right? Now we are all scared of getting it, of course, because it is so. Mm. But does that mean we are not ever going to live any life? We mm. are trying very hard to think through, like if you wear a mask, what reduces the risk of transmission? So living with something today, the word positive is always used in relationship to covid so and so was positive yeah once a word you used in relationship to hiv right mm. so in a sense we all confront today what people mm. confront with hiv and another thing that that was done you, when we talked about hiv who got stigmatized through it gay people mm-hmm. or is mm. gay people's disease sex workers or they spread yeah. hiv right? so yeah. it was also used in a way to tell you that look look at this dark world a forbidden sexuality this is what is going mm. to happen to you if you go there you know it's the mm. pulp fiction does oh she was a beautiful girl but she got misled by so many boys and then she was asking for trouble and she came to a bad end so pulp fiction is always a morality tale of this kind where on the yeah. one you get to taste the forbidden pleasures of talking about sex but then you're given a little like lecture at the end ke aise karoge na beta to phir kuch na kuch to zarur tumhe hoga so that's that sex negativity in a word and that's the main conversation we have about sex the bad effects of sex is the maximum amount of information so when we say mm. sex positive we are saying a conversation in which sex itself even while talking about things that could happen to you that are not nice sex itself is not stigmatized the sex is seen as a positive thing so yes a lot of sex education which emphasizes pleasure which talks about sex in a good way is called sex positive education but pleasure positive a pleasure based sex, uh, sex education i think is a little bit different because what is also mm. is telling you learn what you like mm. if you know what you like it is easier for you to say what you don't like mm. therefore an education in pleasure is very important because you can say i like this i don't like that so to go back to the conversation on consent if you believe as a woman that of course you have desires you can say yes you can say no you can say maybe let's let's wait and see what happens all of that if you feel that about yourself you will be able to express this better and other people will also be accepting of it for you so mm. when it comes to children if you encourage them to think about things that they like that they are comfortable with they can identify what they don't like if you all the time tell them that there's a bogeyman out there everything is bad how is it possible for them to live what mm. is going to be so that good touch bad touch to teach small kids but that confusion remains with us till very late in life and i mean your guys and you talk to guys so you know that straight indian men are consumed by sexual guilt morning to night all the mm. time they are feeling sexually guilty you know and all the time they are making these dichotomies that this is the girl you marry and this is the girl you don't take seriously and what are they doing in that process they're not taking themselves seriously so there's a lot of self hate that emerges So I think that confusion about sex, sex is a bad thing. Having sexual desire means I'm a bad person. I feel guilty when I masturbate. I feel guilty because I had sex. It's a violence to yourself. It's a violence to other people. So even when you're not in a context of sexual abuse, this guilty idea of sex makes you be an abusive person to yourself and others. But Paramita, a lot of it is cultural, right? Like these are things, this, are, this is like what is called cultural conditioning, I believe. um you know this idea like for instance i'm i'm i i identify as catholic hmm. and when we were kids right it was not from my own parents but the implication was always that if you masturbate you will like you know go blind that was a big one yeah, okay you get your hair on your palms 
hair on your palms masturbation obsession to i have seen everywhere even i went to some baba who was like beta tum ye karte ho na isse to tumhara dimag bhang ho jayega kya ho jayega humne kare yeah 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 no it's a cultural thing so how do you push back against something that is uh, so pervasive or so uh, that carries so much weight or authority you know which yeah, is so our culture i think when things are culturally transmitted to us it's useless hmm. to tell people it's a very bad thing you see what happens now what we see around us is there is like a, a woke cultural police and they are continuously scolding everybody and saying oh this is very culturally backward and this site and number is bad and that that is not the way yeah. to change that so that is 100% because of some like you know a uh, one time somebody approached us to do a collaboration and say that oh we want to do a thing about how item numbers are not good i'm like guys if you're going to go and dance to item numbers at a party meaning raat ko you are dancing to the item number and din mein you are giving lecture on internet about how this is very bad and objectifying then what does this mean you know and yeah. i think the real and what you are doing is you are making people feel guilty for enjoying the songs right mm. problem is that you will have very misogynistic lyrics on this most amazing beat you will enjoy it if like i know you mm. are like yeah i shouldn't enjoy it so the thing is creating an atmosphere of censoriousness is no different from people telling you that if you masturbate too much then you'll go blind and your brain will start leaking out of your ears or whatever else people tell us <laughs> <laughs> so i think that the only way to combat it is by creating another culture mm-hmm. that is why agents of ish you know people get confused like is it a sex education site or is it something else it is everything it's not categorizable because this is not a categorizable part of life and just one thing is not enough right and mm, i don't mm. so i don't have such small ambitions in life that i'll just make three things since i don't want to be an influencer i'm free to be as uncategorizable as i want right mm. so how do you combat the whole thing about masturbation well i think one very big way is humor mm. when the first thing that we made about masturbation tackled exactly what you're talking about masturbation myths and we made these mm. really funny videos using you know uh, when there used to be ads in cinema halls when you went in which were like these slides it would just be a slide mm. and then there would be a voice over like it was totally the cinema the movie itself would be very advanced technically but you still had this 1970s ka technology in the ad blaze advertising karke they used to become so we used yeah i remember that ads like gabbard singh holding the glucose packet and then some voice over so we took a lot of this kind of popular cultural material and we made little videos using all these different voices and languages and accents like uri baba i will not masturbate you know so this sort of thing and i am very worried my penis will become bent and crooked and then so it would be done in such an enjoyable and sweetly funny fashion that because what is the importance of creating enjoyment it helps us to not be put on the spot when we all laugh at mm. something together and we are discussing the film we become relaxed and we have the conversation right takes the heat away from talking about these very contentious and your fear of talking about it and being othered in some way is just like slightly diffused when somebody makes something enjoyable the other mm. thing we did first we did these masturbation myths and we also said that everybody doesn't have to masturbate if you don't masturbate because you think it's sinful that's a problem but if you don't masturbate because you don't feel like it it's absolutely okay don't feel pressure to do it right uh then we made um we did the masturbation shairi contest so what again it we called it write write a poem a love poem to self love it was called shairi because shairi is always about you know tumhari zulfe tumhari ada whatever yeah it's, it's all no it's a love poem so it encouraged you to have a good feeling about masturbation one mm. of the things i genuinely feel like even when you say you're catholic right i made a film mm. called sandra which is about sandra from bandra mm. i it's, saw that in fact it, a friend of mine was in it yeah who Rachel Lopez. Of course, yeah, both of us. She was, yeah. Yeah, we both know her. We yeah. both know her pretty well. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that Catholic girls were supposed to be the girls who go out dancing, who have boyfriends, and you know, wear sunrises, racy figure. But the thing is, for me, growing up, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like that. So I don't care hmm. if the world thinks it's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. So when hmm. I make a movie, I'm not going to give a lecture to people and say that look, it's very wrong that you think that way. I really don't care what you think. This hmm. is what hmm. I'm going to make this movie. So it gives other people a very liberated space in which to think differently. You just don't take that myth too much into account. So when we did the masturbation shairi contest, that is a bit of what we did. Then we started asking people things like, "What's your favorite euphemism for masturbation?" 
what did we find? All the euphemisms for masturbation are about male masturbation. Mm. So then we said like, you know, one sex educator that we met during our research, she told us that, you know, yes, yes, we talk, we have separate classes with boys and girls. And we talk to, to tell the boys about masturbation. So I said, you tell the girls. And she's like, uh, well, uh, yes, yes. So I'm like, okay, that means they don't tell girls about masturbation, right? Mm. So we did this very super hit post of ours. We did the ma- female masturbation survey. And we asked all these women mm. questions about masturbation. What's your favorite thing to masturbate with? You know, that was such, first of all, 100 women replied to that survey. That only shocked me. I never thought again that people would do it. But what was really amazing about it, the kind of sweet story. So we asked people, what's your funniest story about masturbation? One person wrote a story about how she ate tandoori chicken, didn't wash her hands properly afterwards, masturbated, and there was a lot of burning that happened as a result. Another story which became really popular was, and also created a lot of urban legend, was these people who talked about how they used to use the old Nokia phone as a vibrator. Okay. So... A lot of people that, that became so popular, that factoid, that we ended up on the Comedy Central Snapchat because of it. And all my colleagues were so excited. That, <laughs> but there was so much uh, Chinese whisper that happened as the information was transferred that finally there was an article that said, whatever, some 17% of Indian women use the Nokia 3300 or whatever. I'm like, it's not it's 17% of the women who took the survey, guys. Please come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, any minute now, if the Nokia 3300 comes back, we are the ones to blame for it. <laughs> so, if that tagline will suddenly change now. <laughs> yeah. So I think like what all of these things do to answer your question about how does one counter myths is it mm. creates a counter myth. It creates a counter culture. And it's mm. like, oh, we have all these funny things. So when somebody says tandoori chicken, now, you know, some English person or Icelandic person or American person, is not going to have this tandoori chicken story. It becomes so relatable. Okay. When you talk about the Nokia 3300, it is people like you. One mm. of the things that has also been happening is that all our information about sexuality is coming from American or European sources. Mm. We are not. We don't actually have Indian stuff with Indian people in it, mm. with Indian mm. reference points. So that creating the words that we use for the genitals are all galis. So to create a new language... Where, where the words for your genitals, where the words for masturbation, where the words for f***ing, all of these things are beautiful and sweet and poetic and enjoyable and naughty in a way that's not disrespectful to each other, right? That is actually the enterprise of a cultural sexual education, mm. which mm. is very different from the sex education that is in school. School can't do all of this. Yes, school yeah. can tell you age-appropriate things which are about your body, which are about acts of sex but beyond a point culture also is if you say culture gives us certain notions and conditions Mm. then anybody who cares to change this cannot do it by scolding other people you Mm. can only do it by creating a counter culture that people want to belong to if Mm. we think about how we changed and how we didn't become like everybody else we knew it's because we saw something we loved we heard a song, we watched a movie, we read a book and it was like, I like this thing. I don't know why I like it, but I like it. I want more of it. I want more of it. What does it tell you? You followed your pleasure. Hmm. Your pleasure took you to yourself. You got to know yourself better. You did something different. You met other people like yourself and the world changed. The world has changed. That's exactly how the world changes. So I think, yeah. yes, cultural education. And the third thing is conversations. Social media has enabled that to have numerous hmm. conversations about sex. They should be inclusive. The difficulty of only relying on sexual education as per manuals and as in books mm. is it's in danger of becoming normative. So it should be seen as fundamental, basic knowledge. But conversations keep it multiple and plural. It acknowledges that there are all kinds of people with all kinds of different needs and desires. And let's just hear each other, right? And so I think a big thing that has happened for us, which I'm very proud of, we had non-stop conversations about consent. Hmm. Because we never said it's a one-time thing. Yes means yes. Okay. Yes means yes and no means no means. It was not like that. Right? Hmm. We kept on talking about consent in various contexts, in various relationships, all of that. It has led actually to something fantastic, which is our sexual etiquette column. It's called Small Doubts. Hmm. And, uh, and it's about small ideas of consent. 
and actually a lot of people began asking us if i look at a girl if i like a girl on the bus and i look at her what is wrong with it why can't i stare at her right mm-hmm. why is it so explaining that well there's nothing wrong with liking a girl and maybe quickly looking and looking away is okay but you can't do it in a way that makes her uncomfortable you can't yeah. because that that is nobody is saying you shouldn't feel desire but your desire should not be at the cost of somebody else's comfort so mm. it makes it all so much easier when you put it in the frame of etiquette yeah. good manners with each other it is so actionable so i feel conversations enable action in a way i think our major takeaway from this i think the very phrase that at the start was sex education like as if it was uh, uh like getting a b or a 12 standard but uh, i guess my takeaway at least from this is that it's a continuous process you know because you keep um you keep learning i keep learning i'm mean, thanks to the internet at least i keep learning new things every day sure. uh you know what you were saying earlier about the culture um culture police and the wokeness etc etc i will disagree with you a little bit over there because um i learned a lot mm-hmm. you know it's academic i agree and a lot of it uh, you know comes from a gender studies class or a gender studies textbook or a sociology textbook but even if you'd ask me i would consider myself relatively aware relatively uh, well read and uh, if you ask me 10 years ago to dis- define what consent is i would not perhaps give you a satisfactory answer sure. you know but i have learned this from uh, the internet and learned this from these conversations and i guess my sexual education also continues you know on a day to day basis i guess i guess for all of us right i mean we keep having these conversations absolutely i mean i think i should preface or i've already said it so i should uh, uh, modify what i said with saying that you know i wouldn't want to police any speech hmm. so even woke speech i'm not going to say that oh, don't do it but i'm saying that it's hmm. it's, it's it's one of many ways to respond yeah. to something Right? and yeah. critique is important but critique should just take some care not to become sex negative or to become so negative that we mm-hmm. don't see a way out and mm-hmm. i think what you say about consent is true i think without me too without conversation yeah. about consent and i mean very difficult out there uh, yeah any of us would not learn i think most interesting thing about me too in india was that mm. these stories which emerged were not necessarily about sexual harassment in the workplace they yeah. were about bad sexual encounters yes and it was so important to talk about it openly because the woman who speaks about any sexual violence is considered a bad woman yeah culturally are hmm. are tumhara naam badnam ho jayega if you talk about being raped or harassed hmm. the fact that you are speaking about sex you are saying i had sex with this person and this is what this person did and i was not okay with it i think for a lot of guys it was uncomfortable but important because they knew it was happening but they could pretend to just you know it's their private matter mm-hmm. and now we understood that it's part of a pattern it's not just it's not random yeah so that okay. is where the term for what you're saying actually there is a phrase for this kind of thing it's called comprehensive sexuality education that is actually a comprehensive education that goes on for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that goes on for the yeah it goes on for life because i'm sure, i'm pretty sure and i think we are all old enough to know this now that what we believe as true or acceptable today is probably going to change massively in the next 10 years or 15 years we're going to see things very differently in the future but this is a good primer i think this is a good place to start yeah absolutely yeah, yeah so we we we'll, uh, goal when we uh, sort of do any of these topics our goal is basically just be a good enough primer so that people can sort of go and explore and uh, on their own and i think this one's uh, this one's also been one of those rare podcasts that we've done where uh we've come from where we started and where we ended up is very different because generally we do our podcast like ha hame general idea hai is cheez ka ha uh-huh. you know we'll we are okay even the conclusion we reach we'll know mm-hmm. but here i think where you sort of taken this conversation has mm-hmm. gone into so many different dimensions that we didn't think of and honestly that's awesome and yeah and- I I mean I was also I also want to ask you guys something which is you know like I I am I am curious about um since you're both not married and mm-hmm. meaning I'm not asking you your orientations but when you think about your intimate life I I want to use only the word sexual um mm. what are the difficulties you all face 
What are the questions you feel are unresolved for you all as grown-ups? Um, should I? You want to go first? Should I go first? I guess for me it was uh, like I said earlier, conditioning. Mm. You know these ideas that you have about what what is desirable or what is like. Okay, I'm going to say something now. Tushar, also brace yourself. <laughs> like the this concept of uh, sexy lingerie. Okay does nothing for me it makes no difference in like you know in 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 any uh, kind of uh, sexual encounter that i've been in what uh, what my partner is wearing right before she takes it off makes no difference to me like you know but so yeah you've been told right culturally whether in movies or in like you know whatever that uh, a, a a person wearing lace or you know these kind of garments are supposed to arouse passion or desire or whatever but they don't do anything for me and that took me some time to figure that out like something as basic as that you know i think the problem or difficulties that uh, i would face as a person was unlearning a lot of stuff mm. that you that you thought was true mm. that you believed because it came to you from reliable sources or you reached this you reached a conclusion based on your own experiences however like messed up or garbled they were and i think yeah unlearning all of that stuff was the most difficult part of my journey i think yeah for for me i think it was it was the thing that i mentioned about you know the uh, the the belana fuslana part of it yeah. where I, i think i was maybe at least 24 25 until i got to a point where i'm like wait no no i'm on this date because i want to be here and she also wants to be here mm-hmm. it's not like you know and because forget even the belana fuslana even there's this subtle messaging you no know, present your best self and your See, and so you're always like, wait, I am, and you're always confused. Am I faking what I am right now in front of this person, or wait, is this a normal version of me? And there are multiple versions of me that are there. So it's it it's that thing. I think uh, that at least for me took a fair amount of time to sort of get over and just be like, okay, you know, this is who I am, and I'm here on a I'm meeting this person or with this person because I want to be and they want to be there. So, but yeah, so it it but it took a lot of like. unlearning because it was very hard to get let go of mm-hmm. but i think so the way you approached pursuing someone right that's also the way you then pursued someone we're like oh mm-hmm. let me give them this impression of myself mm-hmm. let them think i'm like this or whatever that mm-hmm. i think they will like about me yeah so that took a lot of time i think that both the stories are actually very beautiful right and i think also it's not common what both of you are saying i don't think that it's something that we commonly see in everybody and um, one one guy in college just that we interviewed uh, on in one of our videos you know she said this very heartbreaking thing about how sometimes there are people who come to her they've been married for 20 years or more and they've never known sexual pleasure now and that is really it is heartbreaking right mm-hmm. like one mm-hmm. thing to find is a lot of people that we speak to <clears throat> don't have i mean when you say this thing about laundry does nothing for me uh you will be made to feel like oh you're such an unsophisticated fellow the problem is mm. actually you're supposed to be like this right mm, yeah so yeah i feel like it but if people could accept that yeah laundry is something that you know like many other things that we are told it may also be something that women like to wear for themselves women are often told that what you're doing sexually is supposed to be for the gaze of men for the hmm. for women also the unlearning that there are two people who are in a sexual encounter or more and hmm. it's not about one person having to serve the other person's desires but two people hmm. or three people or five people or 10 people finding out hmm. what is the sexual hmm. attraction between them so that you need to be able to say like oh this doesn't do anything for me so then what is it that does do something for me or well this mm. really does something for me so joel i don't really care if you don't like my new purple lace whatever but i mm. love it so i'm going to wear it for my own self because sex will be better for me if i do this right yeah so yeah reaching that place where you can say that look it's not an exam i'm not pursuing yeah. person to score which is you know so i don't have to outwit them i mm. think this i feel that in fact both of these things that you guys have talked about these are the biggest challenges one being able to accept your desires as perfectly valid sexual desires even if it's not what the norm tells you two mm. stop thinking about human interactions as a competition mm. 
as one as, as a conquest and a pursuit and start thinking about it as something mutual that is enjoyable for both people and where we each of us can also be vulnerable i mean it's a terrible pressure if guys are never supposed to be vulnerable and women are never supposed to be strong because it doesn't work like that and yeah yeah i think that it's 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 great that you all could reach that it also shows that if you allow yourself to follow your own heart you do reach somewhere good actually which is mm. what we are being controlled from doing right like we are told like yeah. follow your own desires because it will take you some place bad in fact mm. what you guys have told me is let your desires be and you end up somewhere pretty good yeah like you said earlier in the conversation no that you figure out what you don't like to figure out what you like or you figure out what you like so you figure out what you don't like yeah uh, it's pretty much i guess it's pretty much that's pretty much it no that uh, in my case at least you know one thing about especially the conquest thing that you spoke about pushar that we you know i for me one of the most memorable uh, interactions i had with a group of young men in a workshop and i asked them what is the most uh, difficult thing about dating nowadays and uh, one young man said the effort not to fall in love and mm. the entire room went <sighs> and it's like if you fall in love you're uncool so you're not supposed to have emotions you know you're supposed to be no strings the first person to fall in love is the first guy to blink it's like that and i'm mm. like this sounds extremely exhausting you know like why, why we we can't live like that like so i feel that's what when we were talking about how sex and love get flipped around mm. but the binary is maintained the separation is maintained at all times it's very tiring for us as people yeah. and and i think we see so much mental illness mental health difficulty around us right now some of it is because our emotions are not allowed to be themselves anymore mm. right like it's bad to be emotional and so you're always questioning your emotions it was bad enough that we had to question sex now we also have to question emotions so we are kind of like kare to kya kare kuch nahi karte <laughs> yeah so uh, joel you want to say something no 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 uh, we should uh, yeah, we've you... come to the end i think of our conversation we've covered a fair amount and we've covered yeah we've covered everything that we wanted to talk about today mm-hmm. thank you so much parumita thank you so much for being uh, talking with us today for being our guest on our show kishar so you want to basically uh, just to sum it up basically guys get in touch with uh, what you like what you dislike be open to conversation uh reach out to people with information or seek out information on the internet and uh, just be open minded just just and also be open to the idea that there is stuff that you don't know you will learn it and uh, just uh, go easy on the guilt like, and i th- i think also just remember that having fun is very important and pleasure is to do with maza you know like have maza se jio type of thing and uh, to be charming to other people just to be charming not to score just because yeah. charm is so enjoyable uh, as sharukh khan has shown us <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. so that's actually a lovely note to end on so uh, thank you parumita so much thank you um, just before we go we just like to mention uh, if you like this podcast don't forget to check out our other interesting podcast on the ivm network you can listen to us on ivm podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com you can also follow us on our social media we are ivm podcast on twitter and instagram Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I am Tushar underscore Abhi on Instagram and you are okay, please on uh, Twitter. Uh, Paromita, you are. I am at Paro Devi on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Bombay Rosie. Okay, a uh, Bombay Rosie on Instagram. Yes. And uh, Agents of Fish candles on Twitter and Instagram. Yes, it's Agents of Fish on all platforms. Okay, and Joel, you are. I am Pereira Joel on Twitter and Joel Pereira dot esq on Instagram. Right. That's it from us guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for coming. This was so awesome. Well. How many times have you motivated yourself to improve your sleep or lose weight or be more productive? How many times have you failed? Hi, my name is Ashtin Doctor. Tune into my show The Habit Coach Podcast. where we focus on creating small tiny habits to improve your life instead of those big impossible tasks so make listening to me a habit every monday wednesday and friday on the ivm podcast app 
or ivmpodcast.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, Don Bradman, and now Cyrus Brocha. Okay, probably not in the right company. I mean, Don Bradman is Australian, but it's called Cyrus Says. A wonderful show about everything. Find the show on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts.